Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's really good to see you all, even if you can't quite see you behind some of your masks. Um, of course, we are all operating under different restrictions this morning, and it might feel a little bit strange, but at least we have this opportunity of gathering together for worship on this Sunday. I'll speak more about the future in the sermon. But for now, let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace be with you. And to you in the of Christ. We pray together. Heavenly Father, all hearts are open to you. No secrets are hidden from you. Purify us with the fire of your Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So as we prepare to meet Christ in the heart of the Eucharist, we reflect on the events of our lives since we last met together in church, and so we make our confession. Heavenly Father, we have yes. sinned in thought, word, and deed, and have failed to do what we ought to have done. We are sorry and truly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and lead us in his way to walk as children of God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you and set you free from sin, strengthen you in goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we come to the glory. Let us stand. <coughs> glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, our bliss lives. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so the comic for today, merciful Lord, we give thanks that you are God of life and love. Grant each of us, your servants, the companionship of joy in our lives, comfort in sorrow and strength in need, that we may live together in peace and love all the days of our life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We now have our scripture readings. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they congregated before Aaron and said, Come, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, who brought us up from Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron answered, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and daughters, and bring them to me. <coughs> so all the people stripped themselves of their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He received them from their hands, cast the metal in a mould, and made it into the image of a bull calf. Then they said, Israel, these are your gods that brought you up from Egypt. Seeing this, Aaron built an altar in front of it and announced, Tomorrow there is to be a feast to the Lord. Next day the people rose early, offered whole offerings, and brought shade offerings. After this they sat down to eat and drink, and then gave themselves up to revelry. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, the people you brought up from Egypt, have committed a monstrous act. They have lost no time in turning aside from the way which I commanded them to follow, and cast them for themselves a metal image of a bull calf. They have prostrated themselves before it, 
sacrificed to it and said, Israel, these are your gods that brought you up from Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have considered this people and they see their stubbornness. Now let me alone to pour out my anger on them so that I may put an end to them and make a great nation spring from you. Moses set himself to placate the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why pour out your anger on your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say he meant evil when he took them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your anger and think better of the evil you intend against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self. I shall make your descendants countless as the stars of the heavens and all this land which I have spoken, I shall give to them and they will possess it forever. So the Lord thought better of the evil with which he had threatened his people. The New Testament reading is from Philippians chapter 4. This, my dear friends, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is what it means to stand firm in the Lord. In Odia and Sintage, I appeal to you both. Agree together in the Lord. Yes, and you too, my loyal comrade. I ask you to help these women who shared my struggles in the cause of the Gospel with Clement and my other fellow workers who are enrolled in the Book of Life. I wish you joy in the Lord always. Again, I say, all joy be yours. Be known to everyone for your consideration of others. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious, but in everything, make your request known to God in prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Then the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. And now, my friends, all that is true, all that is noble, all that is just and pure, all that is lovable and attractive, whatever is excellent and admirable, fill your thoughts with these things. Put into practice the lessons I've taught you, the tradition I have passed on, all that you heard me say or saw me do, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. So now let us stand for the Gospel reading. This is the Gospel of Christ according to St. Matthew. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like this. There was a king who arranged a banquet for his son's wedding. But when he sent his servants to summon the guests he had invited, they refused to come. Then he sent other servants, telling them to say to the guests, Look, I've prepared this banquet for you. My bullocks and fatted beasts have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they took no notice. When one went off to his farm, another to his business, and the other seized the servants, attacked them brutally, and killed them. The king was furious. He sent troops to put those murderers to death and set their town on fire. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but the guests I invited, I did not deserve the honour. Go, go out, therefore, to the main thoroughfares and invite everyone you find to the wedding. The servants went out into the streets and collected everyone they could find, good and bad alike, so the hall was packed with guests. When the king came in to watch them feasting, he observed a man who was not dressed for a wedding. My friend, said the king, how did you come to be here without wedding clothes? But he had nothing to say. The king then said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot, fling him out into the dark, a place of wailing and grinding of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
thesis. I think one of the things you probably found with the way that services is, is we seem to be bobbing up and down in our seats because we haven't got the music. Um, the music, very often, is the way that we move our way through a service. It does feel a bit strange that I'm asking you at one moment to sit down and a couple of seconds later to stand back up again. Unfortunately, that's just the way our liturgy is constructed. I mentioned over the last couple of weeks of different sermons that we've had a series of gospel readings where Jesus has talked about various parables and various stories which on first reading seem quite extreme. And I've also mentioned that within the Jewish tradition, and the Jewish tradition is full of humour. I mean, we even to this day, many American comedians come from the Jewish community. They have a particular way of telling stories and using dry humour and exaggeration. So the story we have this morning of the wedding is once again Jesus telling an exaggerated story. It didn't necessarily happen, but he was telling the story to make a point. And he tell, tells a story of a particular wedding. Well, it just happens but yesterday, in the church in Plantisant, was one of our first weddings within the Benefice since March. We had a wonderful wedding, a wonderful couple, and very understanding, and their guests were very understanding, and they had a wonderful time. But that's not the situation we find in this Gospel reading. I don't know how you find the weddings, do you find them enjoyable? Do you find sometimes you can drift off in service, or is it something that you look forward to? Or when you're of a certain age, very often in your 20s and 30s, I know some young couples, they're constantly getting wedding invitations, and it's, oh no, not another wedding invitation, that means I've got to shop for another wedding present, take another we um, weekend off as we go to another wedding. And so, very often, the wedding services become things that people are not always looking forward to. And so we have this in this situation. The king has invited lots of people to a wedding, and they've decided they've got better things to do, to look after their farm, to go about their business. And you think, well, this is a bit rude. They could have put aside an hour or two to attend this local wedding. But what if I said to you that weddings, on average, in Jesus' time, lasted two days. And that's a short wedding. That's the average. That's if you didn't have much money, it would last for two days. Very often, they would last seven days, because seven days, ten days, and seventy days were lucky numbers. So if you were very rich, you allowed the wedding to last seventy days, and you had to provide shelter for the guests, food. You even had to provide clothes. It's elsewhere in the New Testament that the host would have a room full of the most wonderful garments that he could afford for the guests when they arrived they would wash their hands and feet and put on fresh wedding garments and nowadays you know we various people judge weddings by the nature of the dress well in that day and age you judge the whole wedding by all sorts of things by how wealthy the person was to provide the garments not only the wine, the quality of the wine, the wine might run out and then you would be judged as in another parable, another story. So they had to find the wine for two days or right up to 70 days. So the person who was organising the wedding was being very generous indeed. It was a large part of their savings to put on the wedding for two days to 10 days. And these people had turned down this gift. I wonder how you've seen the way that weddings have changed down through the years. They've changed in the way that they're celebrated, they've changed in the way that very often now they don't necessarily happen in church. Actually, I can think of um, story my mum tells that when they got married in the early 60s my father went to the vicar and said what's the earliest time of day that you can have a wedding 
and he said, well, about 10 o'clock, and my father tried to persuade him to have it at 9. And they compromised, and they had the wedding at 9.30, and the reception was at 11, and they were on the train, heading off for their honeymoon by 12 o'clock. My father didn't believe in wasting the whole day sat indoors. Well, nowadays, weddings happen in all sorts of places, at all sorts of times. But at the heart of the wedding, is this idea of a gift. Not only is the couple giving themselves to each other, but the friends and families of the couple are coming together and will cross each other's path, probably, in different ways in the years to come. It's a gift of friendship. The wedding itself is a community event which draws in all sorts of people. So finally, I wonder if you can remember a certain film, The Quiet Man, with John Wayne. And he gets engaged to Catherine Hepburn, who was playing an Irish woman in that film. And she gets very upset with John, who is playing an American, of course, uh, that he has refused her dowry. He says to Catherine Hepburn, well, I've got lots of money, I'm an American, of course. So I don't need your dowry. And this is the biggest insult to her. And she refuses to speak to him for many days until it's corrected. It's corrected, of course, if you remember the film, by a fight, a fight which seems to go travel right across the countryside. And it's a fight which only in John Wayne films everybody seems to enjoy. I'm sure there's other people around here who know that fights generally are not quite as enjoyable as the one in John Wayne's films. So we have here, then finally, a community event. Like mm -hmm. the event yesterday, they couldn't celebrate it in the way that they wanted. There was limited guests, but nevertheless, they brought their families together as a sign of the sharing of the gift that they were celebrating that day. Well, all of us are probably wondering when we can ever go back to how we celebrated things before. Not only church events, and um, that's important, but there's so many aspects of our life which are different at the moment, where the community gets together. Even simple things like my children wondering when they can go back to the cinema, to go out to Pizza Hut. All these things have seemed to have changed, and we have no sign of when they might go back to the way they were. All I can share with you this morning is not any hard facts of how things are going to inevitably arrive to a conclusion, but just the glimpse of hope that all of us are trying to get as much information as possible and working on a timetable, looking at Christmas in particular, that all our churches will have church services of one form or another, as close to Christmas Eve and as Christmas Day as we can manage. And we will try, as best we can, to celebrate Christmas in a way which is enjoyable for all the community, not only of us here present, but the wider community. We recognise that we've not only missed out on Easter, we've missed out on so many community events over the summer, we're missing out on getting together for remembrance and other occasions. But Christmas is vital, and it will be vital to this community that we celebrate it in the most creative way we can. Like the story we've had this morning, when people come together, they share a gift. They share the gift which is represented in God's Son, Jesus, that love is shared within communities where people support each other. And so hopefully we'll be able to continue to share that gift and that example of love in coming weeks. We just need to be creative and patient to find out how that will happen. <coughs> Amen. So now we come to our prayers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and worship you 
recognising that the arrival of a young baby 2,000 years ago to grow into a man but change the world was the greatest gift that this world has seen. We pray that you would help us to be examples of that gift as we continue to deal with the events happening around us by showing love, friendship and hospitality in new creative ways. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. On this day we remember all those who lead us. We particularly pray for Archbishop John and his family, for Bishop June and her family, for all the clergy within this benefice and their families. But most of all, we pray for our government at this time, for those in leadership and those in opposition. But all parties would use their experience, their knowledge and insight of their own individual communities to bring this to bear in a civilised way so that our government may work to new ways in which we as communities will feel supported and feel led. We recognise the vast amount of responsibility that weighs heavy on so many people's shoulders at this time. We pray for the Senate and all who work there. Pray that always when its own ego would not get in the way of working for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Finally, we pray for those present. All of us carry the thoughts and concerns for our own family and friends. We bring those to you now, Heavenly Father, particularly praying for those who are suffering at this time, whether physically, spiritually or mentally, but they would know the presence of your healing spirit, but their concerns would come to the light of others and we would all find a way of supporting them. We pray therefore that you would listen to all our prayers, those spoken and those who remain silent within our hearts as we gather up our prayers together by saying, Mercifully, Father, accept Amen. these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Without moving from our seats, let us share one another the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you.